my next. Okay, now everyone is able to see. So as I said it, today we are going to speak about something really important topic, which is wide complex tachycardia. The reason is, of course, first reason always comes is why are we speaking about it? Because most of the times, I think we all are very much aware, it is mostly like a emergency. And that is the reason we tend to think like this, in fact. And what is the meaning of void burst? Then uh, the meaning is, tachycardia actually means, of course, his heart rate is more than 120. And wide QRS means is the QRS width is more than 120 milliseconds. So this is how typically you see a wide QRS tachycardia. So it is typically, as I said, the heart rate and the QRS criteria it tends to uh, make the difference. Whenever you see a tachycardia like this, what is the differential diagnosis? So what are the other things you should try to see for? So the most common one, as you all know, which is called as supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. Aberrance means not normal conduction. Otherwise, sometimes it can be associated with what is called as pre-excited tachycardia. Pre-excited tachycardia means it is associated with the accessory pathway. Or sometimes there is motion artifact, otherwise it is a paced rhythm as well, otherwise yes. Of course, if it is a VT which can be further of idiopathic or non-idiopathic type. As I said it, it is one of the most common, especially if you come across a wide QRS tachycardia, most of the times you should always think, yes, VT is the reason. But what happens, as I said it, the SVT with aberrancy, what happens, how do you see that? So typically, as I said it, you will be seeing it is associated with a bundle branch block. The bundle branch block can be left bundle, or even the right bundle. So then you can see, as I said, it the, either associated with the left bundle branch or the right bundle branch. So that's pretty easy, right? So what about how the ECG looks like if the if there is accessory pathway mediated tachycardia and someone is already having a bundle branch block? So if you will try to see this ECG, there's ECG which will be coming to your screen. On this, it looks already wide QRS, as I had said it. And then, of course, tachycardia as well, you can see, because when you try to calculate the heart rate for this, you will be noticing the wide QRS as well, and the tachycardia as well. And then, how will you say, is it, it is not a ventricular tachycardia, as I said it. So if you will see carefully in this, V, and A is not associated. So the ventricular conduction is completely independent of the atrial conduction. And that's why you see it as ventricular tachycardia. Now this is another beautiful ECG I would say. So what happens is, what is the thing, what you notice? So for example, when you look at the V1 and V6, so you can notice it, it is a right bundle branch block. Then after that, what do you further notice? You notice is the PI interval is very short, right? So the PI interval, so that's why you can always think that this is most likely a AVRT, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. Okay. So you see the heart rate, it is tachycardia. Further, what else do you think of? When you try to see for the VA interval, it is changing, right? So what was happening initially, the VA was 190 milliseconds, but later on the VA became 145 milliseconds. So earlier it was an orthodromic reentry tachycardia, which became to narrow complex tachycardia. Okay, so this is the difference. So this is indeed very exciting, and and now coming to some pre-excited tachycardia as well. One of the common things always which confuses a lot of people is manifest versus concealed. So how do you differentiate that? So a lot of times, as I had said it, you will be seeing is short in PI and is there delta wave is there. So that's why, yes, you will be knowing, yeah, okay, this is an accessory pathway. But a lot of times you may not be able to see, is it really the short PI may not be present. But what may happen is, only when you have a tachycardia, then you may be able to see. 
So for example, a tachycardia like this. So in a, in a tachycardia, how will you differentiate antidromic and orthodromic? So orthodromic, what happens is the conduction, the anti-grade conduction is happening through the AV node. Okay, anti-grade through AV node and retrograde through the accessory pathway. And then what is antidromic? Antidromic, of course, it means is reverse is happening. So in reverse, what is going to happen is orthodromic, uh, so uh, Author, it will be going anti-grade conduction will be through the accessory pathway and but it will be going up through the AV nodal and that is the difference between the orthodromic and antidromic and that's why it is very important to understand that a lot of times especially when you are there in the ER you may come across some wide QRS tachycardia but if the RR is inter interval is varying so you must try to rule out if it is associated with accessory uh, with atrial fibrillation and yes sometimes as i had already said it that uh, motion artifacts can be there motion artifacts how do you see is you will be noticing that there is marching of the high frequency signals across the whole wide complex tachycardia you must be careful when you try to compare whatever recording you see on the ECG, you should try to match it with the other leads as well. So then you will be able to notice it. So that's why it is very important. Okay. Then what about the paced beats? How do you see in the paced beats? What is the example actually over here? So in the paced beats, if you will be seeing the ECG, you will be able to notice that there will be pacing complexes, pacing, so whenever pacing artifacts is going to be there. So if you are able to notice a pacing artifact, you will be able to know that yes, this is a pace beat. So now coming to the most common wide QRS tachycardia, what do you notice? What will you be, what are the things you will be seeing? It can be of various types, of course, always. And then it can be the most common types of idiopathic, non-idiopathic, the RVOT, LVOT, or fascicular VT are most commonly idiopathic. But the non-idiopathic are ischemic, non-ischemic, hypertrophic, cardiomyopathy, or the channelopathies, in fact. Can anyone tell me how do you diagnose a RVOT VT? How do you diagnose it? Anyone would like to say? So why do you say VT? As I had said it, there's V a dissociation. Then after that, you'll try to look at the morphology of the V1 to V6. So there will be it will be of left bundle branch block. Then after the left bundle branch block, so you know the origin is in right ventricle. So then you try to look in the axis of the inferior leads like 2-3 AVF it is positive then it is pointing to the outflow track okay and then this is how you know the RVOT similarly if you try to get a little bit more insight if lead 1 is positive it will be directing the origin towards the exit site and it will be possibly in the posterior median wall actually okay otherwise of course in the antro lateral wall so what are the other things if you see in the ECG, then you know it is a VT. What are the other things? So for example, if on an ECG, if you will be seeing, there is capture beat. So if you see a capture beat, you will be knowing this is VT. But how do you say it is a capture beat? Capture beat actually refers as I had said it, in VT, there is AV dissociation. But what will happen is, there will be a beat, especially something which will be a little bit slow, which will be when the sinus wave is passing through the AV node and is no longer refractory, so it conducts down the ventricle. And that is why you will be seeing that capture beat. And capture beat, how will you notice this? Because it will be narrow. That's how you will be able to notice it, actually. So then, what about the 
other beats. So the other beat is called as fusion beat. In the fusion beat, what happens is it is normally due to the combination of the sinus impulse and also the ectopic impulse, which is leading to a QRS complex. And that's why it is norm it is different from the sinus node, and of course, different from the premature complex as well. And that's why what you see normally is called as a fusion beat. So, uh, yeah, what are the other things? How will you differentiate that? Is it a VT or a right bundle branch block? So we, what is called as left rabbit ear sign. Okay. So with uh, using this, and uh, if you see a right uh, uh, rabbit ear, then it is VT. So always remember it like this. It is opposite. If it is RBBB, uh, uh, it will not be right rabbit. Do you understand that? So it will be VT in fact. So if it is left rabbit sign, it will be opposite. So that's why this is one of the key things. Okay. I hope, do you all know about this sign? So what are these two signs which you are seeing on your screen? So this is what is called as the Brugada sign and the Josephson sign. So what is it? What are these two signs? So Brugada sign refers when you try to take the distance from the onset of the QRS okay to the nadir or the s wave so which is shown in the red sir, not audible huh? uh can you hear sir, hello excuse me sir not audible okay just a second now can you hear me now hello sir not audible sir now can you hear me can you hear sir, me now not audible just a second Okay, so maybe problem is there with uh, that only single person. So we'll continue. So what I was telling is, so... Sir, not audible, sir. Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Srinivas, kindly check your settings, doctor, because all the other students are able to hear. Thank Sorry you. Dr. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I was telling you, Brugada sign, how do you say it as... You see the distance from where the QRS is starting. Okay. And then from there you go to the nadir of the S wave. I hope you all know which is the S wave. And then you check the distance in the red line which you see it over here. If this distance is more than 100 milliseconds, this is Brugada sign positive. Similarly, if you see a notching near the nadir of s wave so this is the s wave and if you see a notching over here so if you see a notching this is what is called as the josephson sign in fact so if you see brugada sign if you see josephson sign close your eyes and just say this is vt and you must be able to proceed uh, for the of course for the further management how are you going to take care of the patient and that's what is very important okay Now, what is this? So this is what is called as the le left ventricular outflow tract. As I had said it, it's similarly like the RVOT, but on the left side. It is on, the origin is from the outflow tract, but in the left ventricle side. What about this ECG? What do you notice in this ECG actually? So in this ECG, if you try to look carefully, v1 is positive so v1 is positive means it is right bundle branch block then you try to look for the axis when you look at the axis this is left axis deviation so right bundle branch block 
with left axis and VA dissociation present. So it will be left fascicular, posterior, anterior. So what happens is you should be able to know which fascicle as well because sometimes as I had said fascicular VT's management is can be slightly different from the compared to the other VTs. So as I had said it, you try to see with the right bundle branch block, is it left left axis or right axis? If it is right axis, you know it, it is anterior fascicle. If it is left axis, it is posterior fascicle. So as I had said it, those, those were the most common VTs which you see. But sometimes you'll be noticing them as in the form of monomorphic, polymorphic, bidirectional, it could be with the mechanism you can differentiate between re-entry, automaticity or even triggered activity as well. But sometimes what may happen is some of these episodes may be repetitive. And how will you be knowing about repetitive actually? That again it will be getting repeated again and again, again and again. And as I had said it, monomorphic. How do you see in the monomorphic is? It will be only single morphology. And now, how do you say it is bidirectional? In the bidirectional, what will happen is, the axis keeps on changing. So for example, when you are trying to see in the lead to, once it is positive, the other beat is negative. Now, what about the mechanism, as I had said it, how ventricular tachycardia happens actually? So in that, so this is a very beautiful diagram, what happens is, there are different areas, it of course, it also depends upon the resting membrane potential of the cells as well, when it, and then there's a re-entry mechanism as well, so these are some of the mechanisms, and of course, being clinicians, everyone would like to manage how to manage such kind of arrhythmias. So how, what do you do that for this? So you need to be having a good history of the patient. And if you have a good history, then you should go ahead with the examination, take an ECG and maybe, if possible, do a EP study as well. So for example, if you come across a patient who is older, so most of the times it will has to be VT. And if the patient complains of symptoms as palpitations, syncope, diaphoresis, angina, seizures, so these are the classical signs actually. So similarly, if there is history, family history of sudden cardiac death, as well or if you come across the history of medications as intake of QT prolongation drugs or digoxin or diuretics then yes you know what will be the most probable diagnosis similarly why physical examination you should be able to see for the vitals see if the patient has any sternal wound is it there is a associated periveral vascular disease stroke if the patient has pacemaker or ICD in fact or are there any evidences of AV dissociation or cannon waves and yes so a lot of times if you are in doubt if you're not sure of your diagnosis then what will you do is you can try to see for do some maneuvers after ruling out all the contraindications in the sense using a carotid sinus massage you can use drugs as lidocaine adenosin or even beta blocker as well so after that what are the tests you would like to do so some of the tests which is really useful for such kind of patients is serum potassium magnesium and you can also try to do a drug serum concentration level as well okay and you can also in the meantime get a echo done if there's some structural abnormalities 
and the ECG, as I had already said, all those signs, fusion beats, capture beats, the QR's width, the morphology of the bundles, electrical axis, precordial concordance as well. In, in precordial concordance, how will you know that? So most of the times it is either only completely positive or else it is completely negative. Then you know this is a problem. Uh, yeah, it will be VT. Similarly, in the normal sinus rhythm, if you are able to get, you will be able to see the signs of ischemia, acute myocardial infarction or Brugada pattern, or left ventricular hypertrophy, or epsilon waves as well. And if you see AV dissociation, you know that yes, what you are dealing with is the ventricular tachycardia. So there is already something which is called as Bayesian diagnostic algorithm, which is associated with this. And in that, as I had said it, these are the same things which I, we have already spoken about. Like you need to be seeing all these things and then you will be knowing. Let it be the interval, you see the V1, V6 morphology, you try to, there are those other signs as well, the Brugada sign, huh? Brugada sign and even the Josephson sign. So Brugada sign, if you all will remember, what was it? It was from the starting of the QRS to the Nadir of the S wave, if it is more than 100 milliseconds, it is Brugada sign, positive. Similarly, Josephson sign was, what was Josephson sign? Near the Nadir of the S wave, if there is a notching present, it is VT. So now coming to the management part. What do you do, especially in the acutely, if the patient has come to you? If patient is unstable, never... Uh, get bothered, just give a shock, synchronize cardioversion, okay? Yes, if possible, try to use sedative or analgesics as well. If the patient is stable, then you can start them on some antiarrhythmic drug. In the meantime, try to see what is the precipitating cause for this. Is it ischemia, electrolytes, or yeah, if there is need, then you can give an electric cardioversion as well. Regarding the chronic management, you should try to see further. Uh, you can start them on some antiarrhythmic drugs, especially if uh, patient is structurally normal, then class 1C or class 3 as well you can give. Class 3, do you all remember what are the drugs in class 3, antiarrhythmic drugs? So what are the antiarrhythmic drugs in class 3? Does anyone remember? Good, good. I am really happy, Hussain. Wonderful. And what else? What are the other drugs? Amiodron, Dronidron, Sotolol. Okay, great. So yes, and after that, if it is an idiopathic VT, you can even uh, do a EPS RFA, in fact. And, if, and whether if you're trying to consider for the secondary prevention, then yes, you can implant an ICD as well. So when do you do a EP study? So if there's a white curious tachycardia patient in which correct diagnosis is not clear, and after the analysis of available ECG tracings and correct diagnosis is very important because if you want to treat the patient. So then it is very, very important in fact. So in the EP study, what do you do? In the EP study, you try to induce the arrhythmia, you try to do activation or pace mapping or and then finally ablate. And if you ablate, you know in EP study what happens is you completely treat the arrhythmia, in fact. This is one of the beautiful paste maps from the RVOT VT, actually. And once you ablate, no need to give any drugs and all, you have completely cured the case. So, what are the indications for ICD? If 
the E ejection fraction is only less than 35%, then ICD should be given. But if EF is more than 40%, no ICD should be given. Okay. But if the ejection fraction is between 35 to 40, you must do an EP study first. And then maybe, yeah, you can put up an ICD as well. But yes, in all these group of um, patients, you must use beta blockers and if possible, a antiarrhythmic drug as well. So if we want to summarize on an overall basis, if you all will remember the differential diagnosis of wide QRS tachycardia includes VT, supraventricular tachycardia with aberrant conduction, even the accessory pathways as well, sometimes artifacts can be there as well, if otherwise if it is a paced rhythm. But as I said it, VT is the most common wide QRS tachycardia. Your diagnosis will always depend if you have taken a good history you have seen the ECG very well and if you did a good examination of the patient. So that's the reason your clinical skills are always very, very important. Okay, so how you are able to do and then you start thinking about the management and the management as well, as we all already said it, the initial thing is acute management, which always depends. Is the patient stable? If the patient is unstable, as I had said it, always, always go for defibrillation, in fact, without thinking. Whenever in doubt, if you see a wide QRS tachycardia, always treat it as a VT. No doubt about it. Then once you have acutely managed the patient, after that, as I had said it, you can consider the patient for long-term management using the facilities which is available in your hospital of course i think antiarrhythmic drugs will be available then after that you can even consider for ablation as well radio frequency or cryo ablation as well and otherwise if you are trying to think for secondary prevention in fact then you can even just put up a icd as well and i hope you understood it clearly very well the indication when ICD should be implanted for such kind of patients because that is very important to know. So, are there any questions? So, are there any questions so far from our students? Are, were you able to understand what are the points whenever a CG comes to you? What are the things you are going to see? If if anyone will remember, what are the signs which I spoke about already? Yes. So, for example, you will try to see the rate. Hmm? Rate has to be more than 100. So, only then you call it as tachycardia. Rate. Then comes the rhythm. So, rhythm you try to see. Of course, and even in that as well, the rhythm wise, and then if it is a wide QRS, then you know it is a wide QRS tachycardia. Wide QRS means the QRS width should be more than 120. Then after that, there will be differential diagnosis, which I said it. So differential diagnosis, you try to differentiate. Is it an accessory pathway mediated tachycardia or is it SVT with aberrancy? Is there VA dissociation present or is it with a pre-existing bundle branch block? So once you know all these things, then further you will try to go in depth. So for example, if you see always a northwest axis, extreme axis. So most of the times extreme axis, if you see, always think for the ventricular tachycardia. I mean is northwest means lead one is also negative, lead two is also negative. Okay, then after that, for example, something is called as positive concordance. Positive concordance is V1 to V6 if it is completely positive. Otherwise, negative concordance. V1 to V6 is all negative. That is what is called as negative concordance. So if you see positive, 100% 
it is but if it is all negative concordance most likely i would say up to 95% of the times yes it will be vt only but there can be some rare exceptions we will try to discuss about them in the next um, later sessions actually so once you know those things so what were the other signs which we discussed as well on the ecg josephson sign brugada sign right and as i had said it there is no replacement to what is called as the physical examination do the physical examination try to see about it and you also need to try to see what were the factors which induced the arrhythmia what are what is the history why why is the history important in such kind of patients actually anyone why is the history okay. important sorry know the cause of vt exactly know the cause of vt yes yes the cause of ventricular tachycardia right and the other thing as i had shown as well the age age also matters for the patient so age will matter in the sense because if the patient will be uh yeah if the patient is more than 35 as i had said older the patient higher is the chance for vt in fact younger the patient less chance will it be for any vt in fact isn't it not just that yeah uh, even the sex wise as well if it is males males are most probably if for ischemic vts and all they will be more predisposed especially due to the smoking and other things as well for example then as i had said it fascicular vt fascicular vt there will be if patient is having fascicular vt there will be no history of ischemic ischemia history will not be there but what will happen is you will be seeing some narrow curious bundle branch block associated tachycardia it will be there via dissociation will be there and that's how you notice it so that's why these are the things which is very important and once you know the diagnosis you will be able to treat them well as well so any questions so far so now we are almost towards the end for the session <laughs> Hmm? so if there are no questions then uh, see uh, i would always suggest is whenever you, you all attend the lectures you all should try to read it as well uh, in my last few sessions i was trying to give reading list as well try to read what you are going to teach so it will help you okay uh, in the next session we are going to talk about something really important actually uh, which will be about uh it will be about actually ep study so it is a, a basics of ep study so what the electrophysiologists they do and how do they treat it actually <laughs>